All right, everybody, welcome to The Sherman Show. I'm Jeff Sherman, along with my co-host, Sam Lau. Hey, hey. And today is Monday, October 17th. Oh, that's an eerie day, isn't it, in financial history? But October 17th, but it's 2022. And today we have a very special guest coming live from the trading desk at Goldman Sachs. It's Ashok Veridan, who is the global co-head of the Securities Division. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me, Jeff. I just want to get right into the weeds today. But first, before we do, I said I want to delve in. But can you tell us just a little bit about yourself so our listeners know who we're talking to, what got you here, and um, what do you do each day at Goldman? Yeah, so uh, like you said, I kind of co-head our markets business um, with a colleague, Mark Nachman, um, who came up, you know, much more on the investment banking side of the business. My background is, you know, sort of strictly in trading, I'd say. Uh, when I look at the various different products that we have here, you know, in the global markets business, whether it's our rates product, foreign exchange, emerging markets, mortgages, commodities, um, you know, equity derivatives, credit, so on and so forth. I've, you know, probably traded all of them, you know, at some point, um, you know, during my career, but I'd say I really started in the rates business, um, you know, uh, started in the business back in uh, 19, 1994, 1995, which ironically was sort of the last rapid tightening cycle, um, you know, certainly, um, you know, certainly in modern uh, central banking history. Um, and I started at, at Merrill Lynch, worked there for uh, three to four years, and then got laterally recruited to come to Goldman. Uh, and I've been at Goldman since 1998 ever since, so coming up on, on 25 years. And so I uh, have been through, you know, a lot, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of different cycles, a lot of different macroeconomic climates. And what's amazing about the work is, you know, no two are the same. And obviously, you know, the market microstructure has evolved a lot as well. And so, um, you know, that always makes it new and fresh. Um, and, you know, obviously what we're experiencing right now, which I'm sure we'll get into, um, you know, really doesn't have a whole lot of precedence. And so uh, that's fun, too, because, uh, you know, it's good to see movies you haven't seen before. Right. I know Sam likes to watch a lot of the same old classics. You know, he's always watching Roadhouse and stuff. But, you know, um, speaking of the movie that we haven't seen before, you started off talking about similarities to 1994. And, you know, historically, you know, at least in the modern era, um, that's been one of the worst kind of bond routes out there. And, you know, it led to some implosions within like, kind of exotic structures within the mortgage side. But this one's different. So how, how would you juxtapose today's, you know, fixed income market and the carnage we see out there versus, you know, what, what you lived through back in 1994? Yeah, I mean, I'd say there are, uh, you know, some similarities, but obviously some, some, some you know, radical differences. I would say, one, um, you know, we were coming off, I think that the rate at which they started hiking off of was 3%. I think 3% is obviously very different than zero. Yeah. Uh, in terms of, and so the initial condition was far is far more was far more accommodative this go around than certainly it was, uh, you know, in 1994 and 1995. I think ironically, because of that sort of um, unanticipated hiking cycle, which took place, you know, um, subsequent to that, I think, um, you know, certainly the U.S. central bank under Greenspan, then Bernanke, then you know Yellen, and then Powell has always, you know basically because of that 1994-1995 episode has always, you know, when removing accommodation has done so very slowly and very predictably and, and in sort of um, slow, um, you know, uh, and small measured increments to essentially, you know, take the punch bowl away. That, that, that's always been done in a very slow fashion. And obviously we- It's experienced- amazing though, when you, when you say that, I want to cut you off because, you know, just to put that in perspective, the last hiking regime was three years, right? When Yellen started yes. it. Right. And we got to a whopping 250 basis points on the top in the range. So two and three years between 15 and 18. You're right. Yeah. Right. And now we did it in like five months. Right. Yeah. 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 Right. No, it's amazing. And, you know, you think about, you know, the hiking cycle that we had between, you know, 04 and 06. I think it was, you know, 16, 17 hikes or something like that. But each one was 25 basis points, you know, um, you know, uh, in size. And, and obviously Greenspan sort of coined the measured approach. And then obviously subsequent to the financial crisis, as you just highlighted, you know, there was, you know, a whole hell of a lot of transparency and forward guidance around, you know, moving at a very measured pace. But, you know, frankly, um, you know, during that period, that sample period that we talked about really between 1994 and, you know, really up until 2021, 
we never really experienced um, high and troubling inflation. And so that obviously gave you know, central bankers at the time a lot of latitude, one, to when they remove accommodation and remove accommodation at a very sort of slow and steady pace. But second, any time, and I think this is an interesting implication going forward, any time the economy sputtered, and you kind of fell below um, what one was hoping for on output or fell below what one, one was hoping for on the employment side, you know, they could, you know, central banks could basically use their special powers and cut rates and buy bonds and do things like that. And you can't do that when you have, you know, inflation, you know, so much higher um, than your long run target. And so, you know, that superpower has been taken away. And so that's a, that's a very interesting very interesting dynamic that we have right now. Well, I think you kind of nailed it right there too, talking about, well, you can't do certain things during an inflationary regime. And I, I say, Mr. Market just gave a wake up call to the United Kingdom, right? Um, they were trying to go back to these policies of, you know, you know cutting taxes, corporate taxes, higher tax bracket uh, earners, um, trying to run, you know, a structural deficit in the face of inflation. And Mr. Market just punished it, right? Both the the bond vigilantes on the on the you know guilt side. I'm trying to bring that phrase back. So someone told me that we should start bringing that back in the lexicon. But also, you know, through the through the UK uh, through the pound and cables depreciation. And so, as you think about this too, you know, um, I, I think it was a big wake up call to finance ministers around the world that the market just isn't going to accept that post GFC pre pandemic world again. Yeah, I think um, it's a, an important observation and a profound one, which is, again, you know, anytime you ended up having some sort of exhibited fragility in the market. And so forget about just, you know, macroeconomic variables, let's just say, you know, financial stability, market stress. Again, you know, central bankers could come in and essentially be the buyer of last resort, the lender of last resort, the arbitrageur of last resort, whatever, however you want to sort of characterize their mandate. And again, you can do that when you're not in a period of policy removal. But if you're in the midst of sort of normalizing policy rates and engaging in QT, how can you do the antithesis of that right. to stabilize markets? But one of the things that I think is encouraging, and I think it's part of the reason why, again, you know, markets are volatile, but it feels like you know, um, you know, markets are trading with a, like a little bit more confidence or at least opening up sort of the right hand side of the distribution as opposed to obsessing about the downside is when push came to shove, when the UK couldn't get monetary policy response, they did get a political response. In other words, um, you know, the market told them that they couldn't, you know, engage in that sort of fiscal expansion, they couldn't cut taxes, and they basically um, went back on it and you know went back to the drawing board and basically said okay you know the market's not going to let us do this and we don't have the central bank that's going to bail us out indefinitely maybe they'll intervene in the markets for a little bit but they're not programmatically going to intervene so right. therefore we need you know we need to do an about face and that this may be the first time that we've seen you know you always try to i mean it'll become obvious in hindsight it's harder now uh you know to you know to forecast but maybe this is the first time you'll basically see a political solution mm -hmm. to, um, you know, uh, to some, you know, to, to a quagmire delivered by the markets as opposed to a monetary policy solution. Yeah. Well, um, you know, putting your hope in politicians is always dangerous, especially yeah. as an investor, right? Let alone as a citizen, but, but just, um, you know, as an investor. So, you know, uh, the, the Fed has been criticized, um, you know, for using a lot of backward looking metrics. And so inflation's obviously backward looking, right? I mean, we can call it contemporaneous, yeah. but it's always sure. a couple months lag to begin with. Labor, another indicator, uh, by the way, both both are part of their dual mandate, right? Labor and inflation, right? Um, and so, you know, what is your take on where the Fed is too? I mean, given the inflation print last week, we now have the market essentially saying that the Fed's going to hike to roughly 5%, somewhere between 475 and 500 basis points by early next year. Um, what is your take on, first, what the Fed should do, but more importantly, what the Fed will do? And do you think the market kind of has that pricing roughly right? I think market pricing is actually roughly right with respect to, with respect to the front end. I think, you know, 
the implications yeah. of having hiked nearly 500 basis points, you know, over the course of, a, you know, a window of nine months. I think it's very hard to know what the implications of that will be, you know, going forward and what the collateral damage would be. And then what the multiplier effects are of that collateral damage, you know, into the real economy. I think time will tell. And so 2023 will be a movie that we've never seen before um, that that we'll live through. I, I think there's a path dependency to, to all of this, uh, Jeffrey. In other words, you know, had they not been so wrong and, you know, with respect to 2021 and obviously, uh, you know, talking about inflation being transitory. And also, again, we've been talking about monetary policy history. The fact that um, the sequencing subsequent to the financial crisis was I wind down QE first, I wait for a little bit before the onset of the first rate hike, kind of sticking to that sort of sequencing made them very late in, uh-huh. in, in, in 2021 uh, to start normalizing policy. I think as a consequence of that, right, because their forecast was, lo- was so wrong on inflation, they're basically forced to not rely on their forecast and react more to contemporaneous data or backward looking data you know, as you characterize. And so in some sense, I just don't think they have a choice. In other words, I think at this point, um, you know, with a Fed funds rate of between three and three and a quarter, which you could argue is like not really restrictive, right? You still have negative real rates in the front end. I don't think it's very credible to say, yeah, but you know, forward break evens are lower. And so policy works with a lag. So we're going to wait. That being said, I do think that will be a very credible thing to say at 475, because it's 475, you obviously, irrespective of whether you think neutral is two and a half or three or three and a half, at 475, you're sort of, you know, by any, by any measure, sort of well over neutral and you're in restrictive category. Right. And, and then that's like where we were kind of in, in 06, right? I mean, it was five yeah. and a quarter, right? But I mean, like that that's not yeah. outside the realms, right? That's right. And then you can say, okay, we're we're restrictive. And now that we've sort of traversed 450 to 500 basis points, now we have the credibility to say we are restrictive. We have done a lot. We have done yeoman's work. Um, we have taken a lot of fruit punch away from the punch bowl. And so then you're credible to say, we want to take a little bit of a wait and see approach um, because these, these are, um, you know, employment data and, and inflation data, um, you know, are, are, are lagging indicators. And so therefore we want the benefit of a little bit of time. And so I'd say, and what's interesting is you've had a lot of debate up until this point and a lot of criticism of the Fed, you know, by the way, from people who, you know, grew up, you know, um, you know, amongst amongst those policymakers, you know, Bill Dudley, Larry Summer, you know, really criticizing the Fed for being slow moving. I say all of those critics now are basically saying, well, we need to start paying attention to financial stability issues. Right. Right. And, you know, and, and, and maybe, you know, a good stopping time is somewhere in the mid to high fours. And, and from there, take a little bit of a wait and see approach because you don't want to go so much that you really do irreparable harm that then forces you to then start easing aggressively. Right. And and we saw that kind of from the Fed minutes last week. I, I, I've been telling clients that usually they're boring. There's not much to read in there. But I think we gleaned a lot from that, too, that they want to get to a level. They're going to start to slow a little bit, but they don't want to just recant. But if inflation starts slowing, potentially, you know, there's the ability to ease off this a little bit, not a full pivot because the world's ending, but uh, the ability to try to be a bit more accommodative once we get through some of this bout of inflation. But As I think about it, too, I think the fallacy with the Fed was that, you know, they had this new average inflation targeting regime, you know, and so they were trying to tolerate a little bit, calling it uh, transitory, and then ultimately it kind of bit them uh, at the end. And so what other kind of, you know, we're talking about lagged indicators. You're a markets person, right? You You sit in the markets division. So what kind of leading indicators do you look at? What are the big important variables on your screens this morning? And what are they telling you? You know, so I would say, um, you know, a couple of things. I'd say one, you know, looking at energy prices, if you look at sort of how much they've come down since, um, you know, the end of June, you know, they're down sort of 25 to 30%. And I would say, you know, that's happening at a time where it's not like you're getting, you know, great amount of news on the supply side, right? OPEC, you know, uh, uh, you know, basically came out and said that, you know, they're going to cut production by two and a half million barrels 
you know, and so what I would say is, um, you know, what you're seeing certainly on the commodity side, on the good side, um, you know, certainly with respect to, you know, certain indices that track, um, you know, things easing up on the supply side, um, you know, those things are all good stuff, you know, um, they actually look reasonably okay. Like you can argue that goods inflation, you know, has peaked. The other thing is, you know, company announcements, um, you know, with respect to hiring freezes, layoffs, you know, obviously some, some bellwether companies, um, you know, are, are obviously, um, you know, adjusting, you know, their hiring plans that obviously came through in the most recent jolts data, uh, which showed, you know, a contraction of a million, you know, a, a million job openings. And so some of the leading stuff shows that, you know, you are, you are getting a reaction. I'd say the two places that may prove to be frustrating um, for the Fed will be, you know, will be labor and, you know, and will be rents. And maybe that um, relates a little bit more to, again, you know, some of the supply side constraints that exist in, in labor and some of the underinvestment that took place in this country in housing. And I'm not sure monetary policy, um, you know, can, can, can fix that or certainly not fix that with a nine month horizon. Yeah, definitely. I mean, like a seven handle mortgage rate, right? I mean, that's not that's not helpful to the to the housing industry, right? And what I like to remind people is that, well, it's like a housing affordability, but remember, that just pushes people into the renting side of the equation too, right? And so that continues to see pressure. And unfortunately, you know, we know that operates with a significant lag on, on the way it's all estimated, right? And so I think that, that was kind of the shocker last week. In the CPI was that you know we all expect you know there to be this kind of continued pressure on the on the uh, housing equation, but eighty basis points month over month is not what anybody is looking for, both on rent or OER, right? Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. You you raise a good point. If if people are apprehensive about buying homes, they might even incur more negative carry to rent, which perversely, um, you know, uh, you know, certainly in the near term, um, again you know, makes, makes, makes rents very sticky to come down and actually, you know, escalate a little bit. All right. Let I mean, me, ask, well, really I'll, open up to, I'll open up to Sam, but um, what, what I wanted to do too is, you know, let's talk about the credit markets because you, you traffic heavily there as well. Um, what are you seeing from spreads there across various sectors, segments of the credit market? You know, we're, we're starting to see all in yields and like, you know, investment grade paper approach 10% in some areas, right? Um, you know, what is the credit market telling you today? Because we were told Jay Powell focuses on credit metrics when thinking about the functioning of the economy. Yeah, I'd say, you know, despite the fact that credit spreads are wider, um, you know, I'd say, you know, in terms of if you sort of look at, you know, you look at like the composition of the financial conditions index, which is, you know, obviously underlying rates, the dollar, um, stock prices and credit broadly. You, know, you look at those four things of those four parameters, credit has probably been the best behaved you know, in, 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 in 2022. And, you know, in some sense, um, because, you know, the initial condition was starting from a strong place, I actually think, you know, again, on a relative basis, I think, you know, realize the faults are, you know, are, are, are going to be low, even if we end up getting, you know, an economic downturn, you know, calibrated to prior economic downturns, prior recessions, I think, you know, realized defaults will, will come in lower um, than, than, than what we've experienced historically. Um, you know, obviously you will end up, you know, and, and, in, and the places where we've seen some, you know, selling pressure, Jeff, has really been, you know, not really related to credit. So for example, as, uh, you know, UK pension plans needed to raise liquidity, Right. They 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 sold, you know, they sold credit bonds, they sold US credit bonds, UK credit bonds essentially to raise liquidity, not because they had a negative view on credit. It was just a thing in their portfolio that, that they, you know, wanted to sell to essentially deal with the rise in risk-free rates, not yep. deal with the widening of credit. Similarly, you know, you run, you know, one of one of the you know most formidable fixed income asset managers, if you end up seeing redemptions because of higher rates. That might lead you to, you know, to liquidate some credit, pro you know, products. But again, it's not because you have a, a bad outlook on credit. It's just more that you have to deal with redemptions and 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 maybe you know some baby ends up getting thrown out with the bathwater. And so I actually think what you 
when you you started your question, that's the you know I think the most interesting thing to look at, which is wow, for so long, yields and spreads had been repressed such that people basically had to you know move out of fixed income, move out on the complexity scale, move out on the risk spectrum, you know, take more equity risk, um, you know, to to essentially uh, um, you know get reasonable real returns, and now all of a sudden you know, the silver lining and all of this, the destination there may be a little bit bumpy and turbulent, but, um, uh, you know, the journey may be, but once you get to the destination, wow, you know, when we've been living through this, this, this uh, 15 years of repressed bond yields, now all of a sudden um, you get, you get an appropriate, um, you know, risk premium for, for bond and, 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 and credit risk. And so I think that will, you know, in the end, when this settles, wherever it ends up settling, and it'll settle earlier than anybody thinks, um, you'll start to see sort of real support to, to, to both the bond and credit markets. You know, a lot of the focus that, you know, even we've been spending on so far on the podcast, but then really just in just financial media has been on that rate side of monetary policy. But you know, the, the quantitative tightening side so far has been kind of coming in under the radar, but just wanted to get your sense on what you think the impact has been to the, the greater economy and, you know, just as importantly, if not more importantly for our podcast, I guess, financial markets in terms of liquidity from the $60 billion in roll-off on the, the Treasury side and, I guess, you know, up to $35 billion on the on the uh, MBS side. I mean, what are your thoughts on liquidity today? Do you think there's going to be asset sales coming on the MBS agency MBS side and what the impacts are going to be from there? My sense is I don't think you'll end up seeing asset sales. I think, um, you know, when you think about sort of the accounting associated with that, there'd be crystallized losses, you know, uh, um, you know, I think, I think, you know, things being in accrual, you know, is a little bit, you know, certainly more politically palatable than, you know, crystallizing round trip, round trip losses. Um, that being said, it's very hard to quantify. I know, you know, our, our global economics team has tried to do it. I obviously am an avid reader of, of, of other things that people put out. I don't know how to, you know, to say sort of what the tightening in financial conditions is that comes from 60 billion of roll off versus 90 billion versus, you know, it's very hard, you know, you get to these stock versus flow, um, you know, arguments that, that, that are hard. What I will say is separate and distinct from the rise in rates, the price of leverage is also going up. The cost of leverage is also going up. Obviously, the, the obvious way you see that is in, is in credit threads, but I'm being a little bit more granular and specific, which is the cost of basically financing even the safest part of the you know, uh, of, uh, of the market. So, uh, you know, uh, you know, things like, uh, the financing of, you know, T bills a very high quality mortgage product, or even within the mortgage universe, you know, uh, being very, um, you know, being, tar- you know, at the, at the most highest quality part, you know, of the cap stack, you're, you're basically seeing yields on that stuff go up a lot. And I think that's very, uh, related to two things. I think it's, you know, obviously, you know, quantitative tightening. So there's obviously a now much more like a plethora of much more risk-free, higher yielding things available. So therefore you don't have to be in the business of, of uh, you know, so, someone has to compensate you for being in the business of, of providing more leverage. And the other thing is I'd say is, um, you know, uh, you're talking about a banking system that is, I don't, you know, I, I don't wanna say they're capital constrained, but they're very mindful about um, their, their their capital allocation, and so if you're you know if you, if you're Goldman Sachs, you're JP Morgan, or whatever it is, you you know you 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 know that the the impact of quantitative tightening means that there's that much more of high quality stuff that basically needs to be financed, and for us to finance it, we need to set equity aside for doing so. So therefore, we need to that equity needs to earn a return. And so that is those dynamics, and I know I'm being, you know, I'm skipping around a little bit, but all of those dynamics, I think, are feeding into Sam um, sort of quantitative tightening, essentially making the cost of even the highest quality credit, riskless credit, um, those risk-free spreads um, are going up a lot. And I probably I anticipate that they that, that they will not come down um, meaningfully at any point in the near term. 
Yeah, so during the last QT episode, really the, the signs of cracking showed up through the repo market, right? And we know that the Fed has created, you know, a standing repo facility, which is uh, used immensely by money market funds today. And yeah. I heard Waller last week, I think it was last week, maybe it was two weeks ago, came out and he was saying, well, there's all this excess liquidity in the system, you know, and he referenced roughly a $2 trillion number, which is equivalent to what stands in the, the Fed's repo facility. And so I interpreted it somewhat as him saying, well, if banks had higher deposit rates, it wouldn't be so much money in money market, it wouldn't be using this facility. And it's trying to pull credit out of the system too, right? And like you're saying, finance that high quality asset. And so, you know, that was a crack last time in the system. Obviously, no, no two crises are the same. Well, what do you think is something that can play out on the QT side that makes the Fed back off? Is it external financing from like emerging market countries? Um, we heard kind of Yellen and company say, you know, it's our strong currency, but it's your problem. Get on board with the hiking regime, right? Uh, don't stand behind. What do you see as like cracks in the system or, or ways to potentially see that? And again, maybe there's nothing glaringly obvious. It will be with hindsight. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing that speaks out to me, but certainly one of the things that one has to look for is, you know, these these spreads on kind of what I'd say, not cash, but sort of near, you know, cash substitutes and where those things trade. And you want to make sure, even if they're widening, Jeff, even if they grind wider, that they're functioning. And you can get a lot done, you know, within, you know, um, you know, within a reasonable distance of published prices. And that's yeah. the thing that I would look at, like, as a leading indicator, which is, you know, are you starting to see really poor liquidity in things as basic as, um, you know, I lend you dollars and you collateralize it with yen, for yeah. example. Right. That's about as riskless. Super high, super high quality you know, trade. As high as it gets, you know, right? you know and, and, but then all of a sudden to do that. You know, if you start to see two things, one, that that thing is wide, that's OK. You know, that that's fine. If you're a Japanese institution and you want to hold dollars and the price of dollars is what it is, even if it's collateralized by yen, that's fine. But if it starts to oscillate around a lot and you can't, you know, you do one transaction and you can't do another transaction, that would be something where all of a sudden, you know, uh, if I were, you know, had a job as a regulator, or if I was working as a, you know, as a Fed governor, I would say, OK, you know, Again, this has nothing to do with inflation and inflation fighting. This has to do more with sort of market functioning and market plumbing. Maybe you'd have to stand there and sort of be be the lender of dollars of last resort, for example. Uh, um, you, I, that you can observe kind of from like the cross currency basis or something like that, right? Yeah, and and, and I, I gave cross currency yeah. basis as an example, but it could be repo. It could be you know okay. these types of things where you basically say this is. Um, you know, this is this is riskless or asymptotically, you know, near, 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 near riskless. And so you need to that that th those markets are super functioning because now you're getting into the plumbing of the financial system that has nothing to do with, you know, um, uh, you know, where your five one adjustable arm is. That's a completely you know different ball of wax. Yeah, I mean, I guess this is, you know, somewhat similar type question, but, you know, again, around leverage, but more importantly, the flip side of that coin is uh, deleveraging, right? And we just saw it most recent, as we've been talking about in the UK, uh, that was really spurned by the, the bond vigilantes. So let's, let's keep that turn going, uh, Sherman. Bond mm -hmm. vigilantes bring it on, causing rates to really rise rapidly. Um, so we have that, let's just call it in 2022. We may have averted that with the, the Bank of England stepping in. Um, but, you know, just not too recently, we had another deleveraging experience that brought us into another uh, financial market meltdown, I guess, if you can call it 2020 with the REITs de delevering in, in early March. Um, is, are, especially with the UK, I mean, is this just, is there more at risk here that, than we're seeing? I mean, what else, what other, what other financial markets are at risk? Because everyone is kind of experiencing the same thing outside of maybe Turkey, right? Where you're getting the, uh, the rapid move up in uh, overnight interest rates, you're seeing uh, yields move up and, you know, across the, across Europe, you're seeing it go from negative to positive again. So, I mean, it, it can't, is, is the UK this uh, alone in this? And that's where you're going to see it. No, they're not alone. Now? I think, I think one of the reasons why people are paying so much attention to the UK is the catalyst for this was the weak pound. But like the pound's not alone in being weak. Look at the yen, look, look at the euro, look at the Swiss franc, look at the Aussie dollar. Like this is a dollar story 
This isn't a UK story. And one of the things that's, that's interesting is if you look at sort of prior periods of um, deleveraging, global deleveraging, it wasn't just the dollar that rallied. The dollar would rally, the yen would rally, the Swiss franc would rally, you know, um, you know, obviously uh, subsequent to COVID, Bitcoin, you know, well, you know, there were sort of, you know, if, if people wanted to delever and they wanted to go, um, uh, you know, go to a storage of value and, and take risk down, there were maybe five or six things on the menu. Now, because, you know, getting back to the onset of this conversation, because, you know, the Fed or certainly it's priced that they would move 450 to 500 basis points within the span of nine months, the dollar has sort of reestablished itself, not only as a safe haven, but as the only safe haven, like outperforming the yen, outperforming the euro, outperforming the, the, the Swiss franc, outperforming the, the, the British pounds. And so what that's done is that's putting an incredible amount of pressure on sort of non-dollar complexes. The UK was part of it, but, you know, I don't think, you know, I don't think anyone could look at sort of the Japanese bond market or the Japanese currency and say that we're in a state of long run equilibrium right now, right? Okay. There's definitely like a lot of imbalances that are, you know, that are building up there. And so to me, um, you know, what happened in the UK, I want to look at sort of every complex that is, that, um, that is, that, that, that could could end up seeing a delevering episode because of the strength in the dollar. And the implication of that delevering episode is actually that they're going to have to buy more dollars. <laughs> and, and, and so, um, you know, it's not working today. Um, you know, obviously- they, they had a rap- short-term margin call, right? I mean, effectively, yeah. you just have to sell some stuff, right? And they need to, they yeah. need to buy pounds, right? I mean, they had to protect the currency a little bit, right? Yeah. And so, you know, I, uh, you know, I think um, certainly, you know, if you, if you, if you have a view that, you know, there's more, more delevering on the horizon um, and things are going to get worse before they get better, um, I think you have to be, I think you have to lean long dollars. So, so what flips the, the uh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, uh, just on the follow up on the dollar, what flips the dollar over? What, what I think a global recovery, I think if, if you end up getting, you know, uh, uh, you know, or, 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 you know, you end up 2023 ends up being better than, you know, all of the naysayers, um, you know, now you're talking about, you know, you know, people saying odds of recession are 90% or anything like that. If you end up getting, you know, not a recession, but just like kind of below trend growth, real growth in 2023, the dollar get killed. Which is the Fed's hope, right? I mean, that's what that's what they were trying to say at, at the press conference as well. But you know, uh, as I kind of alluded to, this whole you know our, our strong currency, your problem. Well, what makes the Fed blink on this? Is, is it just that look, we're inflation fighters. You should be too. It's a global phenomenon. Uh, everybody should be moving in concert with U.S. policy. Or is there a breaking point when something stops functioning? Like. Oh, how, how do you see that changing uh, absent either the recession and then per, and the ensuing recovery or just, you know, kind of, as you painted, the soft landing where we make it through? Yeah, I don't, I mean, again, my view is you don't have to think too much about that now because I think the Fed, you know, despite the fact that they're doing a lot, you know, and they're mobilizing in a very big way, has actually given you a fair amount of cum- communique yeah. With respect to what to expect, you know, certainly for the balance balance of the year. And by the way, even if that, you know, inflation number last week, Jeff, had not been two tenths high and had been on consensus, I actually think the market still would have been, you know, at 75 bits, yeah. um, you know, in the upcoming meeting because they're kind of on autopilot to get right. to sort of that restrictive level. And now maybe the band around that is 25 basis points or something like that. I think the real um, issue will be when you get there, what does the data look like in terms of all of the parameters that they're sensitive to? And what does the economy look like? Yeah. And I don't like, and I think you have to, you know, as you invest today, you have to think through what will work and what will be protected in whatever the states of the world are then. But I don't think there's a lot that we're going to learn between now and the end of the year 
both on the data side or on the monetary policy side. Yeah, and maybe that's uh, why we have the volatility in rates, why we have the volatility in spreads, is that you know the market is pricing those uncertainties, right? And it's like yes. you know, and and really, it's hard to say because, as you pointed out, even with your you know experience of almost thirty years now, right? I mean, this is unprecedented, right? I mean, the the the, the rapidity and the speed with which they have have hiked, you know, their commitment to continue to do so, and at some point, you know, that lag kicks in. So I, I, a lot of our investors are, are looking at things, they're saying, well, look, the bond market's down. I'm saying, look, at the end of the day, if you can do the underwriting again, you think this is money good, it's a great opportunity. But let's take the other side of that coin. Let's talk about the equity market today. We know bonds have gotten cheap. What are you thinking about in terms of equity multiples? I mean, we've seen real yields go up. Um, well, how are you feeling about the equity market today? Yeah, I mean, I'd say conventional wisdom is that the equity market is still expensive. I think you have to sit there and ask why. Um, you know, why, you know, the one thing I'd say is, again, remember equity is, you know, they're like the PV of the next 30 years. So sometimes you can get really bogged down into, you know, what's transpiring today or what's going to transpire over the course of the next six months. You know, I was talking at our management committee this morning, which is, you know, uh, you know, from March 09 to July 09 or something like that, like the S&P rallied 50%. And the data was terrible because the market basically looked past that period and said, you know, the worst was behind us. I think one of the things you have to be incredibly mindful of is, you know, again, once you end up getting to whatever that terminal rate is that you talked about, four and three quarters, five, you know, whatever it is, think about how much of the distribution you have now underneath you. Yeah. You know, uh, in terms of in, in terms of how much lower rates can go, and how that can serve as a a put or uh, you know some sort of you know uh, measure to sort of fortify you know equity valuations. And so I think there's a lot of emphasis on you know 2023 20, earnings, you know, um, and what the multiple would be, you know, what well, well, you know. Well, if as, you know, if you only earn two hundred dollars and you have a sixteen multiple, that's thirty two hundred. Okay, that's just one year, in like a series of years, and you could end up getting multiple expansion if at some point, you know, you end up get you know you end up getting rates falling. And so I have a much more open, you know, uh, much more open view. If you tell me thirty two hundred is the bottom of where equities can go, then by construction, I don't think you get there because there needs to be some option value over and above the bottom. And sure. so, you know, and so I, I'm, I, I think equities are expensive, but I think they can stay expensive and they can get more expensive. Um, and, and by the way, I, I think it's weird to be negative on equities and have all of us say, well, wow, you know, bond yields, certainly if you slap a, a credit spread on, on top of that is tantalizing. If that's sure. the case where it's tantalizing, then that also should be fairly supportive for equities. All right, let's play the converse. And this is Sam's favorite question usually is, you know, what, what don't you like or what would you avoid in the short term? Yeah, I'd say um, I still believe in the short term, I'd say, um, despite the fact that it's had a horrible run, I'd say sort of growth, growth equity, anything where, you know, companies, uh, you know, don't, don't have profitability, you can't see a way, you can't imagine a way to profitability. And then, you know, all of a sudden, um, you know, the reason, you know, the reason why people buy it is because you think of, you know, some sort of greater fool theory, like, you know, someone else is going to come in and basically, you know, they'll get it entirely through multiple expansion. And I say like multiple expansion from hundred times sales to 150 times sales, you know, or something like that. I, st I still think that, you know, I think when you end up getting this type of normalization um, after 15 years of, you know, negative, you know, negative interest rate policy, zero interest rate policy, juxtaposed to, uh, you know, bond market interventions by the, by sovereigns that essentially nationalize their bond markets. When you really, when you really think about it, when you end up getting, you know, this type of adjustment where you get this normalization and the bond markets essentially get returned to the private sector, like what we saw in the UK, um, there's a market discipline that ends up getting enforced. And so what I would avoid is anything, 
that sort of relies on lack of market discipline. Um, yeah. And so, and so that, 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 that's what I'm paying sort of a lot of, you know, making sure, again, if things ameliorate themselves and things get a little bit better, not to, not to go back into those things. Okay. No, it makes sense. So, so I always have a great time chatting with you. We, this is usually our conversations. We have this spitball in and, and speed fire round, but before we let you leave, we got to introduce you to Sam's favorite part of the show, which is our equivalent of our conversation. So Sam. Yeah, my favorite spitballing comes through Sherman Says, Ashok. It's where I will give a series of alternating prompts, which I'm still kind of working on right here, but uh, uh, to which I'm hoping to get a top of mind response from you and Sherman. I'm going to have Sherman give you out the, uh, provide this example with my prompt to him of peak bearishness. Almost there. All right, I'll show to you with financial stability. At risk. VIX. Who, who watches the VIX anymore? It's all about the move index, you know? It's, it's rates, baby. It's rates. So, uh, right. you know, uh, I'm going I'm to counter that with move. I'll take it. Uh, I'll show it back to you with, uh, let's say, U.S. recession. Less likely than people think. I thought you were going to say 100% probability over the long term. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Well, actually, now I'm going to take this away from you, Sherman, because I know what your answer is going to be. Like. Um, core, good. To you. <laughs> core goods. Uh, decelerating not as quickly as most of us would have thought, especially with the handoff to services. Yeah, did uh, tag in, right? Services. They just completed yeah. the swap there. Uh, let's see, over back to you, Ashok, with the complacency. Gone. <laughs> Nuclear. I hope you're talking about energy. <laughs> Take your pick, man. Take um, your pick. Yeah, I mean, we need multiple energy sources. So that's what I'll focus on. All right. This is more of a question, Ashok, uh, or it is a question, let's just say. Which are we more likely to see first, 100 basis point hike or cut? 100 basis point cut. All right. And then uh, final round for each one of you here, Sherman's, yours is Joe Montana. Um, you know, one of the best. He's not the GOAT. I mean, we all seen Brady, but, um, you know, he was awesome to watch. He was a phenomenal quarterback. Uh, Jimmy G is not Joe Montana. All right. And last one to wrap us all up and bring us home, Ashok, is Christian Leitner. <laughs> Um, greatest NCAA tournament player ever. <laughs> what, what a great 30 for 30 as well, too, right? Yeah. Um, you know, so, um, yeah, he, he was absolutely clutch, right? Yeah. He was a beast. Yeah. I've got a note here, Ashok, that you attended Duke University and yes. you were uh, affiliated with the basketball team. I was manager of the basketball team. Yeah. All right. There we go. Kimbrough, Mark Kimbrough, our analyst, doing some work here with this. So he's doing some digging. Appreciate it. I love it, it. I love it. See, we get a little cult of personality too. So thanks again, Ashok. This is Ashok uh, Veridan, uh, global co-head of the securities division, uh, all around good markets guy. Ashok, if people want to know more about what you guys do, what's the best way for them to get in touch with you or, or your colleagues? Yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, you can go to the Goldman website, you know, and, and read a little bit about the company and obviously, you know, the global markets business and everything that we scan. Um, but, you know, we're pretty, we're, we're pretty, pretty accessible group um, and eager to, eager to engage. So, you know, reach out to us in some way, shape or form, you know, it's fairly easy in this day and age to, to contact people and, you know, obviously, um, you know, be helpful any way we can. All right. Well, thanks. I, I know this is helpful to our listeners today. So I wanted to thank everyone for listening. Uh, hopefully you gain, gain some insight and some of the stuff we're working on behind the scenes uh, to help manage portfolios through these unprecedented times. So take care all and we'll be in touch soon with the next episode coming very shortly. Mm -hmm.